guys, welcome back to my channel. It's Hannah. I'm here with Tom, the most beloved member of Let's Talk About Books, baby. Hello. And we're here to share Tom's underrated books today. So we just um, had a quick chat last night and went through Tom's story graph, which I will link in the description if you want to follow him, um, about some books that he um, loved. And then I like referenced which ones I don't think are talked about that much on BookTube. Some of them might be also popular, but I think these, um, the ones I have read of these deserve more hype and there's a lot of these that I would also like to read. So we only have a few to show you because obviously they're Tom's favourite books so they are in the Netherlands but a few that we share copies of I have to show you. So let's get started with your um, number one which is probably someone you go on about <laughs> all the time um, and that is Richard Wagamese. So tell us about your love affair with w Richard Wagamese. Yeah so who is he? Why do you love him? Okay, so he is, um, or he was, I think he's passed away now. Um, he was a Canadian uh, First Nations writer. I believe he was Ojibwe. Um, and I think he's he got quite a lot of recognition in Canada, but I don't think that came until later life, really, because I know he personally had a lot of problems with alcoholism and um, mental health problems, I mean, as a lot of um, First Nations communities do. And I first um, came across his stuff when we were in... We were in Canada, I we? I Yeah, I can't remember if we were actually... Uh, yeah, I think it was when we were in Vancouver. Yeah, on um, a holiday, not... Yeah, and there was just like, we went into some bookshops and stuff then. Um, we love to seek out, or like if we're visiting yeah. somewhere, we love to seek out an author from that place. Like when we went to India, we read lots of books about India and the same for South Korea. And um, yeah. yeah, that was I. That was something you were doing when we were in Canada. Which is interesting now because your research obviously <laughs> is going to end up, take us back to Canada at some yeah. point soon. Um, so does he write about First Nations experiences? He does, yeah. So I've read um, both Indian Horse and Medicine Walk. Well, cause I bought the, so the first one I bought was Indian Horse and I loved it so much yeah, you that did. I bought Medicine Walk um, as well. And I, th I think Indian Horse is better cause it's just like, well not better, but it's just like, I don't know, it was so arresting. And even when now I think of like, oh, like what books I love, like that it's so, it's so foremost. So is that mind. the one about the ice hockey? Yeah. So it, Take some um, ice hockey, um, and it's a First Nations, a boy who's um, like separated from his parents and taken to a residential school where he obviously suffers horrendous abuse. Um, and one of the ways he um, kind of escapes from that is through ice hockey. But his relationship with ice hockey is really complicated because he learnt that through. The residential school and there's a mm. lot in there about and he later in life has a lot of problems with alcoholism which i'm sure are it's like of, semi autobiographical yeah exactly. um was richard wagami so raised in a residential school i don't no i th yeah i think he i know he was and i don't think he was raised by his parents okay um but it and just the kind of the depiction of trauma and anguish in that book and that yeah i don't know it's that collective and historical trauma pain yeah like faced by those like, I, like it's really um it's quite bleak. really arresting but yeah i don't know but also i guess how he he kind of deals and processes that and especially later in life he kind of he tries to reconnect with his Ojibwe heritage and he obviously ties in some uh, Ojibwe cosmology um, into uh, his experiences and yeah I don't know you said you've not heard anyone talk about him um, I'm sure like Canadian people will yeah but I be definitely aware not him, in the UK have like, I heard yeah he's, I do want to read him but I think he, you said it's really sad it is yeah it is really kind of harrowing but maybe when we spend some time in Canada uh, later in the year yeah, I will but yeah I just go and just go and read it <laughs> okay next up you have a dry white season yes so a dry white season I think the author is Andre Blink, is it Blink or Brink? Brink, I think. Yeah, who is the cover. a 
Nice. <laughs> uh, who is a... Oh, I don't know if he's still alive, actually. I think he's passed away. Yeah, but it's... I, and I, it's an old book. I think it came out in, like, 1979 mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and so it's set in apartheid South Africa. And um, Andre Brink, I believe, is a white... Or was a white South African man. Um... And I, I've never really read too many books set in South Africa. Me neither. Um, but obviously like, I've read like Nelson Mandela's autobiography yeah. and that kind of thing. But I just thought this book is, is such a frank depiction of racism in South Africa. And it doesn't end in some sort of like all singing or dancing everything works out yeah like it's tied like, in a neat bird yeah yeah it's very like i guess very um very real in that sense and about how people don't care about the deaths of black people in south africa and just the probably does draw a lot of comparisons to um like books on race here in the uk because i feel like most people read if you live in the uk or america you books that center racism are either set in america or the uk yeah definitely. so like it's quite yeah, interesting yeah. to get another perspective on that um it's the same that i know in canada lots of canadian bloggers i follow when particularly this past summer were saying like people always herald canada as this that like, utopia but we have so many problems with racism with poverty and stuff like that and i think it and um, obviously like with the first nations trauma and it kind of goes back to the idea that i don't know these are like universal problems you need to read across the board yeah, definitely, and obviously just accepting that each place is so specific in the particular set of yeah. historical and power relations that inform uh, what's going on there. Yeah, um, But yeah, it's a really, really good book if you um, get the chance to read. Okay, next up is one that I've spoken about on my channel. I put in a recommendation video, but I actually haven't read it, but it was comes from good work from you. And I, we don't have our copy because you've lent it to one of your best friends, haven't you? Which is The Sympathizer. Yeah, by Viet Tan and Guillen. Um, but I love um, Viet Tang's short stories, but I'm yet to pick this up, but I'm desperate to. So yeah. tell us about The well, Sympathizer. Well, I, I quite like a... Um like a, a satire especially yeah. like conflict based satire you went through quite a phase of reading a lot of my yeah. you're at the library like oh, you've got a those... case of exploding mangoes yeah, got... and i really like catch 22 you've got loads of like indian based satire out i remember yeah yeah um and yeah this is a satire set in across the us and vietnam um and it's yeah it's about a uh, a communist sympathizer in the US who uh, goes back to Vietnam to join like the the resistance against the US and uh, is there also a love story entangled in it? Do I mean that? Mm, it's been a while, so I can't actually remember. But um, yeah, it's really it's quite really really long, funny isn't and it? but yeah, but like also quite like an epic, would you politically um, spot on. Yeah, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's I think it's probably over 400 pages, but yeah, it's a really good read and I'm uh, excited for his sequel. sequel. Oh yeah, that is good. Okay, the next one we do have a copy of and I actually love this book and I haven't hyped it enough on this channel and that is Oil and Water by Helene Habile. Will you tell us about, I think I bought this for you like on a whim when yeah. you first started reading because I wasn't sure when we first started dating, Tom was a, I, I only read non-fiction kind of guy. So I was buying you like, you know, political fiction and, you know, investigative journalism. So uh, Helen Habile is a journalist by profession. Yeah. So this is very much rooted in his journalistic experience, isn't it? Yeah, so it's set in the Niger Delta um, and it's about um, how oil companies there are, I don't know, have, have ruined the ecosystem and what that means for the local people um and yeah he gets embroiled in this quite tense situation with so locals tense. and like the the militants that are supporting the oil companies yeah it's very like you're not sure who is actually the good guy at which point and it's very like basically you follow them on this kidnapping trip where these journalists are following to find out about this um, white woman who's been kidnapped who's one of the oil executives wives from bp yeah and you follow them 
on the journey sort of like they are outsiders but then they become very embroiled there's also alcoholism is quite intense in this there's a lot of injury <laughs> yeah um and i think it's just quite a good depiction i mean it's getting worse every year but just the the violence that is enacted against um environmental uh, defenders especially of indigenous uh, communities yeah, that like are we protecting them well and yeah and things. it's really prescient um Slight, going off on a slight tangent, but Ken Sarawila, who was a Nigerian journalist, poet, an academic, who is like executed for his um, his resistance against um, oil company exploitation of the natural world, and yeah, like in Nigeria, which is obviously so um, so oil rich, like this is a real problem yeah it's a comment on imperialism on colonialism yeah, and how it's tied up in capitalism and but it's not one of because tom has a huge issue which we could probably make a video on about <laughs> climate change fiction and how he finds the dystopian or you can say what your main issue is with it yeah well i mean maybe this is another video <laughs> tell us if you want to hear tom's views but um this is one of those books i feel like does climate change at its narrative center really well yeah, because definitely. it is very intersectional in the way that it's taking into account racism and colonialism and all those things. It's not just like, oh, um, England's flooded and now we've got to save it. <laughs> yeah, and just taking on this bizarre, like, apocalyptic thing, which is just really depoliticising and doesn't really do any meaningful action in... I haven't read, we haven't read any of his, he's got two other books, no, we I should think, seek those yeah, out. Yeah, they've been on my list, I think, I've just never got round to it. We should definitely seek those out. Okay, and then um, the next one I have to share is one I've also featured on my channel that I want to read that I haven't read yet, but the recommendation came from Tom. It's another Canadian book, and it's Small Beauty by Gia King Wilson Yang. So tell us when you first read this. I reckon it would have been... Oh, when we what, first like, moved 2018, it. yeah, because yeah. I remember getting out of the library and... Um, yeah, I'd, I'd never heard of it, and I just know, I think you, like, picked it out, and you're like, oh, like, yeah, maybe give this one a go, and I was like, okay. I like, think off the back of you probably reading Rich Wag Me, so I thought you would, like, we were look, looking at Canadian yeah, stuff. Yeah, I didn't really know um, what to expect, like, I, still, to be honest, I still haven't read that many books by trans or non-binary authors. Yeah. Um. So I guess this was quite a... Uh, I don't know, an introductory text for me. Um, but it doesn't centre transness as no, sort of like no. issue fiction, is it? No, no. Um, and it's about their experience living in a small town in Canada and um, how they kind of um, seek solidarity among the very small non-binary community there um, and how, yeah, I don't know, it's just a really good book quite quiet would you say in tone yeah and it deals with obviously kind of mental health and that kind of thing but yeah it's a really great but uh, yeah i was surprised when i read it that it wasn't more um no, it's published by tiny press yeah but it's a really really good book i'm excited to read that one okay and then i have on your list imagine me gone which you referenced in your haul video tell us about imagine me gone I can't remember the author's name it's okay i'll put a picture here okay i think it's adam something um, but yeah, this is a book about which ties together music and mental health. Um, and yeah, it's a story of this family um, kind of growing up. And I think he's the eldest, but he, you know, struggles a lot with mental health. Um, but he's also like a real, yeah, music nerd. Like he loves New Order and stuff and it's about how I don't know how music is used by him as a coping thing um, and how it's been really important at all stages of his life um, interesting did you find it therapeutic to read or is it quite depressing it's quite depressing um, but relatable yeah relatable for anyone that likes music I think it's a really um, good read nice nice okay and then i have a non-fiction author which i'm not saying she's not famous because we both absolutely adore her but like i feel like maybe on the world of booktube like outside of the weird 
academic circles like she's getting more popular or has been more popular especially on twitter but that's naomi klein and she writes about intersectional environmentalism one of our first dates fun fact was to go to see a lecture of naomi klein that's how we live the rock and roll lifestyle right we now. are the metropolitan liberal elite. <laughs> um, which was actually amazing i've never felt more it was like one of the first i wasn't in university at the time so it was one of the first like lectures outside of watching people talk about feminism i've ever seen and i felt so galvanized like standing at the end and we were all clapping and there was like all different people in the audience and that really set off a train of us going to those sort of events when we lived in london didn't it yeah and i loved it it's really good but anyway tell us why you love naomi klein tom famously once said if he would cheat on me with anyone it would be naomi klein <laughs> which she is very beautiful but i just think that's really funny um yeah she i mean i feel like she's quite big but, but Tom thinks people are really famous when they're like in his <laughs> academic world. I feel like to the mainstream bookstagrammer, maybe not. Um, What's her most accessible text, would you say? Um, I'd say probably no is not enough. I would agree. So um, that's the book she wrote um, as Trump came in. Yeah. Well, which I, I feel like would be really interesting to reread now that he's left. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think I was first introduced to her work by my geography teacher when I was at school who um had a copy of No Logo um and so and he was like talking about it and I was like oh yeah I'll read that um but I think the first book of hers I read was The Shock Doctrine mm -hmm. which is her next one about um disaster capitalism and then I moved on to No Logo which is about uh the fast fashion industry that one's particularly interesting, I think, because it really takes, it's a very intersectional, like I say, view of environmentalism, and she really takes into account the different aspects of fast fashion, and I think especially if, if you're someone that cares about clothes or is, has an interest in fashion, it's particularly interesting to read, because there's a lot of those classic arguments I see in um, mainstream news that people are like, oh, but if we stop buying fast fashion, like, all those people won't ever have a job or like yeah yeah you know the whole the whole of Bangladesh will go bankrupt if we stop supporting Topshop and things like that so I think it's a really interesting book and definitely not an introductory text but like if you are really keen it's one of those ones that really changed my mind for good if you know what I mean yeah um then she also has this changes everything which is really great oh yeah I listened to that on audio that um, was fantastic about the intersection of capitalism and climate change and she how we got ourselves son, into this she? Mess. yeah and i think i like her so much and i respect her so much because she occupies that very rare position between like the elite world of academia and like public access yeah um and uh, yeah while i wouldn't say it's not like uh, everyone can read um her books but i feel like if you have a, like a certain base level of understanding of stuff um i don't know it's a really great introduction to a lot of ideas and i think the way she speaks about like explicitly framing climate change um in terms of capitalism is really useful for thinking how we got into this mess and doesn't like I know, I think it's quite frustrating when, um, I don't know, it's seen as this event that suddenly crept up on us mm. when it's been, you know, we, for a long time. We, yeah, and we literally built entire societies and systems of being around the murder of the planet. Yeah, she really chose that line between individual and collective action, which I find really helpful. Yeah, and she's actually good in proposing... New, yeah, because new she, forms of um, she championed action. the Leap Manifesto, didn't she? Over in, yeah. again, she's Canadian, right? But she's American, but she lives in Canada. Yeah, she moved to Canada and she was quite young, I think. Yeah, we just love where Canada stands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, and she was at the head of the Leap Manifesto, which was like their version of the New Green Deal. Yeah. Um, but she really takes into account and speaks to um, Indigenous and First Nations people. And she's just very, I don't know, she's like one of those people that's really using her privilege for good, I would say. Yeah, definitely. Our link, she did a really cool interview called Welcome to the Intersectional Empire with... Um, it's on Nevera News. Yeah, and I will link that down below if you want to like it at all. Yeah. 
Who needs the right book, actually? Yeah, that would be sick. Okay, and the last book we have time for today, Thomas, is White Chrysanthemum. So you read this when you went through a phase of, I think this is when you used to work full time. Not that you don't work full time now. I meant like when you were commuting to London, I used to be in charge of doing the library pickups, right? And Tom wasn't like that, that into books. I think I read that when I was at Sussex. Maybe it was before that. But I didn't. But anyway, I was just the one reserving books at the library yeah, yeah. and like bringing a bunch home. So when we first moved here, we were very broke, and um, I would just go off what you had last enjoyed. So you'd last read Pachenko. So then I think I got you like three other books about similar well, yeah, situations. And, and we were going to Korea. As yeah. Well, so we were trying to read some Korean, Korean fiction. fiction. So tell us about White Chrysanthemum and why you rate it. Um, so it's a, a dual timeline book set between the present day and um, Korea when it was ruled by or invaded by uh, Imperial Japan. Right. And it also takes place across um, Jeju Island in Korea as well as... Where, uh, fun fact, we actually went and then we, Tom, we went on a tour and our tour guide <laughs> said that Tom looked like Wayne Rooney. Mr. Kang. <laughs> Mr. Kang, our favourite tour guide, said, <laughs> kept calling him Wayne Rooney. Anyway, that's <laughs> what I might think about that all the time. Um, and yeah, it also takes place in uh, what, one, what once was Manchuria, which was the area of China and... Mongolia and Russia. Basically, it's this woman whose sister was taken as a comfort woman. Interesting. Um, which is very harrowing. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it explores that forgotten, or not forgotten necessarily, but still quite unacknowledged um, history of Imperial Japan in Korea. And the thing is um, quite quite illustrative of that um i don't know that the historical relationship between japan and korea and the i don't know it really it's really stark about the horrific um practices that are inflicted upon a lot of women who are just take like obviously this taken from she's just taken from her um like a fishing village in jeju island um, where she's a, a hanyeo, which is oh, yeah. the, they're like a all female, um, like deep sea divers, and they go and hunt pearls. Pearls. We saw one when we were there. Yeah, we? It yeah. was amazing. It's like a long, long, long standing cultural tradition of like they don't. It's all like free diving. Yeah. Um, so it has a lot of cultural context, I guess. Yeah, definitely, and I think it's quite an interesting juxtaposition of how. Obviously, as a woman, as a Hanya, she's like, has a very um, important, yeah, role. important cultural role, and then she's just taken to be this kind of subservient. Yeah, so like um, about choice and yeah. free will. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I really do need to pick that one up. It's a longie, isn't it? No. Oh, how many pages? Like 250. Oh, okay. Well, I definitely Yeah, need to it's just up quite, then. quite. Um, Dark. quite harrowing yeah. sorry i realize the sun is really blinding you now isn't it? it's like been moving but anyway that is tom's underrated video underrated books um if you like this please give it a thumbs up we would obviously love it if you could subscribe and we will see you again for a new video next week thanks for watching bye goodbye